Good everyone. On behalf of Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage and the entire conservation industry, I extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished speaker, Nick Boyles, and everyone who has joined us for this talk in the Conservation Insight 2020 lecture series. I'm Dr. Padma Rohana, Director ICI Delhi. Now to introduce our speaker, Nick Boyles, ACR, accredited conservator restorer with over 20 years experience in the conservation of historically important buildings, monuments, and sculptures. Has worked on important projects such as the Temple of Decision Kingdom of Fife, Rosalind Chapel, Edinburgh, Park Building, and the Kelvin Way Bridge Statuary. Nick has featured on the 2013 BBC documentary about the conservation works of Rosalind Chapel. He's a member of SPA huh? Portland Committee. The title of today's talk is Philosophical and Practical Considerations in the Deconstruction and Reconstruction of Public Statuary. Waves of Change After Public Statuary, Sculpture and Monuments. And this paper will explore issues of value, context, authenticity, and practical challenges in the resultant demands of careful deconstruction, relocation, and reconstruction. Presented through three significant Scottish case studies, Sir William Mackinnon statue, Campbell Town, Earl Haig statue, and Scottish Horse Monument, Edinburgh Castle, and Robert Burns statue in Edinburgh. This paper will share consideration of philosophical and practical nature and describe the conservation challenges therein. Before I invite Nick Boyce, may I please request all of you to mute your microphones. The questions will be taken up right after the talk, so please type in those in the chat box. And also type in your name, ad email address, and name of the organization in the chat. Thank you. Over to you, Nick. Thank, thank you, Papa. And thank you to INTAC Conservation Institute for inviting me once again to share what is my own passion. And I have to say that this is perhaps the centre of my interest, is the careful deconstruction and reconstruction of public sculpture. So without further ado, I will continue. So... Along the headline, of course, it talks about the practical considerations in the deconstruction and reconstruction of public sculpture. But what I hope to do is to weave through this presentation some of the more philosophical aspects, some of the moral aspects, some of the um, value aspects, context um, of public sculpture. And if I skip over any sort of philosophical aspect, I will challenge you to please come back to me in the chat and we will continue that discussion after this presentation. But for the purpose of um, case studies, we have three. The first being, I think it's fair to say my first effort at the deconstruction and reconstruction of public sculpture which is the statue of Sir William MacKinnon. And that occurred in 2003, such a long time ago. And I hope you'll recognize me in some of these photographs. And then we scroll forwards into 2010, and we are then using the Earl Haig equestrian statue to, um, as the vehicle through which we can discuss some of the practicalities and some of the philosophical issues. And then we're slamming right up to date with the Robert Burns statue. Um, Robert Burns is Scotland's own writer of poetry, most beautiful poetry and song. And his significance is enormous. Um, and we discuss the sort of value aspects of the reconstruction, deconstruction of that particular statue. Um, <clears throat> so, for your interest, you are at the center of this map and I am at the top left-hand corner of this map. And in detail, I am in the northern part of the United Kingdom. And if I could just focus you on the word Edinburgh, this is where I am sitting right now. And the um, scope of these three projects in terms of geography are located within about 150 miles of each other. So um, I'll continue, I'll go on to sort of give you detailed information as to the location of these monuments, but we are tracking from west of Scotland through to the east of Scotland. 
So during her uh, introduction, Padma discussed or just mentioned waves of change. And this is a term that I've developed, I think, in terms of waves of change. It's quite an interesting concept in terms of a statue stays still, but what changes is the environment, whether that's a political environment, whether in the case of one of these projects, whether it's an infrastructure development, i.e. the road has to change, therefore the public sculpture has to change. Um, there are laws that relate to public sculpture that have changed, which have impacted on public sculpture. And what's interesting is that even if um, a statue has had to be deconstructed and reconstructed for very practical reasons, then of course its contact, context changes. And in my experience, particularly with one of these case studies, which I'll elaborate on a little bit later, the value of that statue has actually increased as a result of a change in its environment. In fact, that's the case for two of these statues, I will argue, during the course of this presentation. So the first uh, statue that we are going to look at is Sir William Mackinnon statue. And you can see that the Google uh, pin that I've dropped sits on uh, an extreme westerly aspect of uh, Scotland. And this is the Mull of Kintyre. And Campbelltown is a town at the south of that Kintyre um, peninsula. Um, and this particular case study will talk about some of the practical, limita practical limitations of actually moving statues on the public road. So this is, the, this is an archive photograph of the Sir William Mackinnon statue. And Sir William Mackinnon, uh, this statue was originally built in the grounds of a school which he founded. And what's of interest is that there is an identical statue in Mombasa. Um, the foundry created two statues, one for the school that he created in Scotland and another for the school he created in Mombasa. So there is a, a twin aspect, but not to this. This is the deconstruction and the reconstruction of this one statue. And this statue was founded in the south of England. So you can imagine that it has already traveled um, a significant distance north coming to Scotland. And of course, the item that has gone to Mombasa has traveled an even further distance. That, is, that goes without saying. But it is um, of interest for me to find the signature of the founder, original founders. So this, for those of you who perhaps can't quite see it, is founded by J.W. Singer and Sons, and they are located in Froome and London. Froome is a town in the southwest of England. And these, so, the first time that we see the Sir William Mackinnon statue, then it's interesting to view its scale, interesting to view the different materials that it's, create, that it's constructed of, and it's interesting to view the method of construction. And here we have a view of two masons um, using um, hand tools to try and open the construction joint around the base of this bronze figure. And what we can also see from this 2003 photograph is the condition of the bronze itself. We can see that there's a, um, a great deal of verdigris, sort of a copper corrosion product that's um, turning the surface of this bronze green. And in some cases, and here's the first philosophical issue, some people view verdigris as the green of Greece, as a an entirely viable bronze surface. Conservators such as myself might view verdigris as a corrosion product and something that should be reversed. Does it, in fact, does it, in fact, comply with the designer's original intention? So I'll leave that particular issue hanging in the air. So here we are, um, 2003, 
rudimentary health and safety, I have to admit, the handrail of that scaffolding is far too low. Um, and the sort of nature, the lack of um, personal protective equipment is clear for everyone to see. However, in my defense, this is 2003 and things have come, when I say things, focus on health and safety, focus on safe working methods, focus on the, everybody's right to go home after a hard day's work, um, have continued to develop to this current day. And actually these three case studies will also demonstrate the sort of growing up of health and safety considerations. So that's myself standing on the top of the scaffold um, uh, with my with two of my workers there and we are just working out at this point how to carefully deconstruct this statue, where it will separate, how we will sling it carefully. So this is early in my company's existence. We have two unsigned written vans, you can see on the right hand side, and we have brought this HIAB, this crane equipped lorry from Edinburgh with us in order to do two things. One, provide us with lifting ability of the bronze and the masonry elements of the statue. And also, once that has occurred, then to transport the subject to where we are going. And here you can see the work is in progress. It didn't happen this quickly, obviously, but through a matter of hours and a matter of understanding and a matter of carefully clearing construction joints to determine exactly which elements will separate easily and well. And so I knew then and I know now that often there is a significant fixing between the bronze statue itself and the first top course of masonry. And one other of these case studies will demonstrate um, visually just the, the nature of that fixing. So don't be surprised that when we lift the figure of Sir, uh, Sir William McKinnon, then the first um, course of masonry comes with it uh, at no detriment to the figure whatsoever. And then the subsequent courses of masonry are carefully um, recorded, construction joints excavated, carefully slung, and now lifted using the hydraulic crane on the lorry. But you can see that the weather conditions have deteriorated and we're suddenly working in the rain. And there is a material difference then with the um, effect, efficacy of the slings versus polished granite, especially polished granite that tapers upwards, a very difficult uh, item to sling, particularly in the rain. However, care and consideration is required to ensure that the, the intervention that we're making will not be at the detriment of the material of the subject itself. And here you can see that the, in the foreground that the site of the statue is now bare. So we have removed every item of this, um, this statue. Every component has been carefully removed and loaded onto one single lorry. And care and attention obviously has to be given to ensuring that there is no, de no damage to the subject during transportation. So here you can see myself and one of my guys um, creating a bed effectively for the figure. So the base projects and so the bronze figure itself um, has to be um, supported along its length so as not to, off so as not to um, provide, you know, have any unforeseen circumstance, any opening any defects um, in the legs, for example. So we have to engage brain and, and conduct everything, every essential thought and consideration to the best um, benefit of the statue itself. And here you can see the load is 
ready to depart and the items are carefully strapped to the bed of the lorry in a very practical sense and tarpaulin created over the top of the lorry, the weather's cleared up and a net ensuring that nothing comes loose, nothing um, comes off the lorry. Uh, these are significant and important considerations. And so here is another philosophical issue. So the moment that we began to deconstruct the statue of Sir William, uh, Sir William Sink, uh, McKinnon, we are changing the context. This is a massive departure from the designer's original intent to build the, build the statue within the grounds of the school. Now, this is promoted by the fact that the school has now closed and that that context sort of disappeared long before we touched the statue, if you can see what I mean. So the environment around the statue changed, a wave of change occurred, which was the closing of the school, which meant that there was a move amongst stakeholders to relocate this statue back to the birthplace of Sir William uh, McKinnon. And again, in a practical sense, if I can just draw your eyes to the right hand side of this slide where it says Dumbarton, and then I'd like you to travel with me up the A82 up to the Trossachs National Park, and then we disappear off the map. And then we come back down the road, A83, down to Loch Gilpet, and then we Tarbert, and then we go down the A83, down to Campbelltown. Now, let me tell you that this project um, found a little bit of fame by being mentioned on the radio, not because of the great conservation effort that was being made to reconstruct this statue, and not because um, it was going to be put back up in a place of his birthplace. It made the radio because we were um, a slow moving vehicle on this very complex road. And um, it was acknowledged that we were um, uh, a consideration when it came to people um, planning their traffic movements. So anyway, any publicity is good publicity, right? So there we were um, making our way through this 110 miles or so, up and down through the valleys and then down through the Mull of Kintyre. Previous to the reconstruction of, uh, the deconstruction of Sir William MacKinnon, then we needed to create a site for the reconstruction. And this was in every sense a greenfield site. This was the first stage of a much larger um, development of a sports centre um, within which Sir William McKinnon statue was going to be in the grounds. But just in the way that I like it, the statue came first and the development came after. So we had a greenfield site. And so top left, as we found it. Top right, you can see the yellow spray paint just marking the site. Bottom left, you can see excavation by small digger. And then bottom right, you can see myself and a joiner, shutter joiner, installing the timber shutter work that would create, that will create the base, the foundations upon which we will reconstruct the statue. Top left, you can see that, that base has been poured, that concrete base has been poured and the um, shutter has been removed. And what you can see is a circular foundation with a, um, a detail around the perimeter, which I will come to talk about a little bit later. And we are back within the same scene as the deconstruction now, and we can see that the Items that were on the lorry have been unloaded. In fact, you can see one of the hydraulic legs of the lorry in that slide at the top right. And the first course of masonry is going onto that foundation. 
And then you can see the subsequent courses being built up. You can see the great care and attention to ensure that the construction joints, for example, are the same width as they were intended to be. So we recorded this detail while we were deconstructing um, the Sir William McKinnon statue. And you can see the use of a spirit level within that bottom left slide to ensure that when we build these steps that they are absolutely as intended, that they are built level and that the statue will be plumb as the original designer intended. And on the right hand side, you can see it's raining again. And we have the base parts, the steps that go uh, up to the base of the statue are complete. And this is a view in the reign of the bronze figure having been stood back up and then moved set to one side. So it's been placed on sleepers near the site. Um, and what you see here are the two masons clearing the um, beds of both of these large stones with hand tools. Actually, one of them is using uh, a drill, but not in the sense of drilling anything. It is a vibrating uh, chisel, which is making short but effective work of removing uh, mortar, cement mortar adherences from the bed of each of these um, stones. Because we know that the original designer intended for the construction joints between these stones to be very, very fine indeed. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, not least because there is an inscription across these particular courses of stone that will that need to read uninterrupted. And here is a closer view of those two um, masons working away uh, to, to prepare these stones for uh, being before they are built back into the construction. And we're back into the challenge of working in the wet. Okay, so as long as you're dressed in the right material, the right equipment, then, you know, we suffer no problem. However, there is material difference. And I've already explained that we have a material difference in the relationship between the slings and the polished stone surface. So we're having to actually undersling these items, whereas we were able to um, use a different method that didn't interfere with the lower bed when we lifted these stones up in the dry. And you can see the rain is interfering with the lime mortar bed um, underlying. So we've got a little bit more of a challenge to, to make sure that we get this stone down and sitting neatly and squarely on its bed, but it is achieved. And here we are working with the next component and you see myself having a very good look at the underside of this stone to determine um, the amount of cement mortar adherences that need to be taken off um, this, the bottom of the bed of this component before it's laid on the prepared bed that you can see with the two scaffold boards. Meanwhile, we're being observed by the statue itself. And the weather has dried somewhat. And we can see that we can re revert back to that relationship between sling and dry-ish surface, meaning we can lay this stone without having a sling underlying the stone, without interfering with the bed, meaning we can make a much neater, much more straightforward effort in terms of lowering this stone um, onto its bed. 1300 hours. And continuing to work sequentially, there is the matter of carefully slinging the statue of Sir William McKinnon itself. And this is a matter of a ladder against the, the, the statue and ensuring that the softened uh, slings are um, secure. There's no opportunity for any slippage. And but more importantly, that when the statue um, is lifted from the ground that it's flying vertical so these you know you find me using some 
aircraft terms to make, make sure that these elements are, are sitting correctly within the slings to ensure that when they go back down onto the bed, then there's no um, crushing of any particular um, part of the component and there's no pushing away of mortar as the thing sits down onto its bed. It is our best effort to make sure that this thing flies absolutely straight so that it can be manipulated carefully and then lowered within millimeter accuracy. And that is what we have achieved just here. So myself waiting now on the scaffolding and we're relieved to see that the, 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 we've got the handrail height a little bit better in this case. And the uh, crane driver, who's not one of our team, but is the lorry driver, but who became one of our team because his um, judgment on the controls of the of the um, of the hydraulic crane um, became beautifully um, almost telepathic communication between himself and myself. And this is. Uh, an image then of the bronze statue being lowered in place. Um, you can see that if you look at the, the masonry construction and the top course of the masonry attached to the statue itself, then there is about two or 300 millimeters that it still needs to shift to the right hand side. This is work in progress. But um, I'm going to roll in another sort of philosophical consideration right here. So the local stakeholders, it's the um, people of Campbelltown who wished for their, the statue of their, effectively their son to come and return to Campbelltown. And just with any piece of public sculpture, the way it faces is important. And so it was important to the local stakeholders that Sir William Sinclair was looking seemed to look, obviously because he doesn't have any eyes, but was seen to face the, um, the lifeboat house, which is in the direction that he's facing. And then there, were another, there was another party of stakeholders who wanted Solium uh, McKinnon to face um, his former birthplace, which was across the bay. Anyway, we were able with the consent of our client at this point to turn Sir William Sinclair. So his gaze was at the lifeboat house, but his chest was facing his birthplace. So as a matter of great fortune, we were able, able to make sure everybody was happy with the positioning of this statue at that time. And the, 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 the marine nature of Sir William McKinnon uh, is portrayed within the sort of bronze ta tablets within um, the uh, base of the statue. Um, and that's utterly fitting for where he now is located within um, 300 meters of the, 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 the coast and the beautiful bay that Campbelltown sits in. And after the works were completed, we were able to effect a number of conservation treatments. So for example, the bronze panels were each treated to um, an application of microporous wax as a protective weather bearing surface in order to prohibit the further growth of verdigris. And here you can see a, a view of uh, demonstrating a little bit of that gaze that's going in one direction and his chest that is going in another. And once the construction was complete, then it's a matter of pointing the construction joints. And in this case, obviously, we're using lime mortar. And you can see the sort of neat and tidy job. You can see, you can see also that we're still um, working with wet conditions. So it's important that we do not make a mess. We are trying to be as neat and tidy as possible and at that bottom you can see that there is still this vacant aspect this shelf within the foundations and there you can see the 
um, reconstructed figure of Sir William MacKinnon within his hometown. But the moving of Sir William, Sir William MacKinnon um, changed its context and asked for, the stakeholders asked for a further inscription in order to make an explanation of um, Sir William MacKinnon and just seal the bond between the, the, four, the figure of Sir William MacKinnon and Campbelltown. And so they commissioned a local poet to create um, this short piece of poetry dedicated to um, Sir, William, Sir William MacKinnon. So it's local stakeholders effectively creating their own um, signature on this statue. So again, changing the context again. And the sort of renewing of inscriptions is an interesting aspect to changing and making public sculpture more current. So in the UK, obviously, right now, we have a particular issue with regard to historic public statues that relate to the slave trade, that relate to um, less pleasant colonial aspects of the United Kingdom. And quite rightly, questions are being asked. And in fact, actions are being taken to deconstruct the, those statues, but not in a careful way. And so, just to demonstrate that the, the outer um, the outer circumference of this foundation was intended to um, to bed this uh, inscription. But when we returned back to the statue to bed the inscription, it was about a year or eighteen months later, and, and it was fascinating for me to go back and just make sure that our intervention was durable and correct. And what I observed was that in spite of the fact of putting microcrystalline wax on the, on the bronze surface, we have this verdigris runoff occurring and it's turned the construction joints green. So this is um, interesting. And there you can see that the carved inscription being installed within that socket and there is the finished article. So we're now going to move east. And here's a map just to show where Edinburgh Castle is. Um, and we're right in the center of the city that I'm currently sitting in. And Earl Haig was, the equestrian statue of Earl Haig was located on the Edinburgh Castle Esplanade, which is an honorable and beautiful place in itself. However, you can see that at this time, and this photograph was perhaps taken in 2008, the Esplanade was used as something of a car park. And so this has an impact, obviously, on the significance of the Earl Haig statue. So whereas perhaps the original designer intended it to be in a commanding and um, impressive location, that is somehow um, diluted by the fact that it's now a bus car park. And in fact, in the background, you can see a number of um, monuments. So one of the first things that we did with relation to these items was to create um, a document that really challenged the idea that the uh, assembly of uh, different monuments within a small area, whether it was in fact a designed scheme of different items all at the same time, or whether there was an ad hoc nature of the positioning of these different highly valuable pub pieces of public sculpture. <coughs> Excuse me. And what we were able actually to determine was that there was an ad hoc nature of the installation of these items and allied to the fact that um, where the Earl Haig equestrian statue was located he was um, subject to not malicious but unfriendly and unhelpful tactile access by visitors 
who would simply walk up the plinth and hold on to and have photographs taken with the statue itself. But that had um, a practical result. And that was that so much of the bronze um, bridal wear, for example, the bridle and the reins and the halter and other aspects of the bronze statue had become broken and um, no longer were the original designer's intent. So here we roll in another philosophical aspect that the, in a sense that the equestrian statue of Earl Haig was too accessible, was too easy to touch and was suffering damage as a result. Now, the driver of this whole project was the fact that on this castle esplanade every year there is what's known as the Edinburgh military tattoo which is almost um, a theatrical event which requires grandstands and seating to be um, installed on the, um, on the on the castle esplanade itself and during that process every year there is a threat to the sculpture not only the Earl Haig statue, but all the other um, monuments on the Esplanade. Um, the final straw that broke the camel's back, which required intervention, was the fact that the grandstand uh, construction that was built every year was changed in itself, another wave of change, because the previous grandstand was not compliant in terms of disability access, for example. So in terms of providing better access for physically disabled visitors to the tattoo, a new tattoo stand was designed and built. And quite frankly, the Earl Hay equestrian statue was in the way, as was a number of the others. For example, there's a monument to the Scottish Horse Regiment that needed to be um, built outside the castle esplanade on a construction which brought it up level. So Earl Haig, important, we wrote a conservation assessment report and I wrote a detailed specification as to the process by which we were going to deconstruct the statue, which involved, before we touched the statue, was to create a working drawing. So conservation is all about keeping record and especially when there is such an intervention as the deconstruction and the fragmentation of the components we need to know which components are which and how they relate to one another and that requires a very detailed um, working drawing and here you can see we have the numerical system of individual stones um, actually attached now this is um, an interesting practice that we engaged with at the time because we've actually got the working, the sort of um, numeric identification system um, drawn onto the surface of the stones with um, chalk. Whereas um, I think we have now learnt that there is jeopardy in this process. So these numbers could be washed off these numbers could be rubbed off, they're, they're not durable. And if they stayed, then they could well be an, an unintended um, aspect to the reconstruction of this monument. It may be that there's a faint line, a faint image of these numbers remaining on the stones. So what we like to do now is to number the, um, each individual item using an alphanumeric identification system on the bed on the top bed of these stones. And we use a multi-layered material. I won't talk about that just now because that will be illustrated later on. But it's interesting that, you know, even within the 10 years of this project, um, methodology has moved on to ensure that we're, um, we are preserving as much authenticity of a given subject as possible. And here you can see um, a view, you can see the piece of chalk, you can see the chalk written number that is actually on an unclean stone, so there is 
jeopardy there that that number will come off. But what you can also see is a printout of the a photograph of the base, and you can see some uh, typewriter correction fluid, and you can see a thick felt tip pen. And this is the multi-layered, and on the top stone, if you can look at the top of the screen to the right hand side of the pen, you can see a white patch there. So we have Paraloid B72 on the stone as the removable um, layer. We have correction fluid, brilliant white patch, generally about um, 10 millimeters by 10 millimeters, no, 20 millimeters by 20 millimeters, about that. And then the black felt tip pen indelibly written on top of the correction fluid. And that is a durable, that is uh, an easily removed method of identifying these individual stones. And once we deconstructed the um, main parts of this beautiful rocky um, plinth, then we have access to the, um, the equestrian statue and its plinth. So again, this statue is securely located, securely fixed to the uh, stone element and the, the two of them are lifted together. And you can see here the equestrian statue um, appearing to fly through the air, but of course it's attached to a large crane. And it will be, at this point, loaded onto a lorry, again, carefully um, supported with timber. We're not asking the horse's legs to take the effort of transportation. Um, so we have to make sure that we um, ensure there's sufficient protection, sufficient bracing in there for that. And this gave us an opportunity to take the whole of the um, rocky plinth and the equestrian statue into our workshop in order to conduct essential conservation and repair um, works. So you can see we have a conservator working away at removing verdigris in this case and reapplying a microcrystalline wax to provide a, um, a weather protection surface to the bronze. And um, the bridle, the horse's bridle, will be carefully repaired and reconstructed. And you can see behind the equestrian statue the, the pallets of stones that themselves received remedial works. So um, just as you saw on the lorry with the Sir William McKinnon statue, we need to remove um, cement, mortar, um, residue from these stones in order that they can be rebuilt correctly according to the designer's original intent. And here we have a view of Her Royal Highness, the Princess Royal, unveiling the reconstructed uh, figure of Earl Haig um, within Edinburgh Castle itself. So no longer in the bus car park, or rather no longer in the esplanade, but now located within a quadrangle. And Greek and Roman um, statuary informs us that there is a special relationship with equestrian statues within a quadrangle arrangement. And um, it's my subjective view that Earl Haig statue works incredibly well within its current situation and no longer receives the um, lazy climbing of the plinth for photo photography. Um, and as a result, the repaired reins and um, correct um, saddle and items of importance um, remain intact right there. So the, I'm just going to go backwards and just talk a little bit about the view of Earl Haig currently. So Earl Haig was uh, a general, a British general, who um, is hated by some people and yet loved by others. So the reason why he's hated, perhaps unfairly hated, but disliked, and um, history has not uh, treated Earl Haig particularly well. Earl Haig was a young general 
during the Boer War, when the British were fighting in Africa. And Earl Haig's perception at that time was that the mechanical aspect of war, for example, machine guns, were unreliable and would jam in those conditions. And yet he was an older general in the First World War, and he sent young men out of the trenches into the face of machine gun fire because it was his perception that they would fail and they would not work. But of course, they, they worked very, very well. And then we had the slaughter of thousands, tens of thousands of young men at that time. So, but on the other hand, Earl Haig um, was the founder of the poppy. So the remembrance that occurs within the United Kingdom. So there is a, a massive charitable organization that he founded and that his wife founded um, to make sure that the, the war dead and injured were recognized uh, on the same date every year. So the third case study that we are going to look at, we are going even further east. And I would like to draw your attention to Edinburgh in the center of the map. And then top right hand corner, we're looking at Leith. This is the, the Robert Burns statue. And what you can see, this is an archive image. Um, this is before any intervention whatsoever. Um, and you can see that it's a, a beautiful red sandstone um, uh, plinth with an exquisitely um, animated figure of Robert Burns surmounting it. However, I was asked to look at it and being the conservator, I immediately began to see items of defect, damage and decay affecting the structure. So we have biological growth. We have uh, this particular item, this bracket, for example, scrolled bracket is broken right the way through, as you can see. We have scaling of the red sandstone uh, details next to these bronze panels. Um, a matter of preferential erosion right there. And you can see on the right hand slide further defects occurring as a result of the relationship between a soft stone and a hard material. But we were asked, right, which wave of change is asking us to intervene with this statue? Well, in this case, it is the building of a extending of a tram network through the Edinburgh streets into Leith and um, onwards and the tram needs to go through the place that the Robert Burns statue is located. This is a view of um, our first intervention. So you can begin to see that the um, building health and safety infrastructure is growing up. You can see that the um, temporary modular fencing is, has grown up. You can see that signage has grown up and you can see that we're using um, protective personal equipment in high visibility work where, in fact, we needed to wear flam proof overalls because of the excavations, local excavations, exposing gas pipes and the like. So this is a very different environment than I was working in in 2003, as you can imagine. And the first rule of conservation is to record and um, this is consistent so so William McKinnon had a rudimentary paper recording technique to ensure that we knew the, the, the size of the construction joints that we knew how the that simple structure came apart and went back together again. Earl Haig you saw a slightly more complex sophisticated um, recording technique using photography and um, annotated photography and site record. And in this case, we are conducting digital recording of this, this figure. And I'm just going to play you um, an animation of that photogrammetric survey that we did. So we are effectively flying through the air. We are moving around the uh, statue. We can, as a result of the photographic element of photogrammetry, we can see the condition of the, the biological growth 
But what this gives is us um, the, the more detailed scans give us millimeter perfection in terms of reconstructing the statue were we required to put it back in its original place. However, what we, what we came to learn was that this statue had been moved once already. So here we can see founded this, this, particular, found, this particular statue built um, and uh, finished in 1898. Um, and here we can see the scaffold structure, again, much more complex. This is a work in progress view of the scaffolding. It's to become fully enclosed. It's be to become a lifting beam and a reception platform so that we can lift items off and move them to a reception platform where they can be lifted by a hydraulic crane on the lorry. But this is work in progress and you can see the, the nature of the infrastructure, the health and safety based infrastructure around us. And this is nothing better than finding a date on the, on the statue. So here we can see founded and built in 1898. And it's my job to determine and understand how the, what the relationship is between the bronze statue and the masonry below. And we remember that Sir William, uh, Sir William McKinnon came apart um, securely located to the top course of masonry. And um, the Earl Haig statue came apart securely attached to the um, top course of masonry. And I am working here in December 2019 in full expectation that this is going to be the same. But it is my responsibility to interrogate the construction joints and work out whether or not there is a secure fixing um, located between the, the bronze figure and the um, supporting masonry. More of that anon. So here you can see we have scaffolders full time working um, to adapt the scaffold safely so that we can reach, how we have tactile access to the figure of uh, Robert Burns. I can sling that statue in the same way as I slung uh, Sir William McKinnon 15 years earlier uh, in order that the statue flies uh, vertically but then can be easily laid down on the bed of the lorry. But the scaffolders here are removing the scaffold boards that I was able to stand on to sling this in order to give, um, to move the object, move the scaffold structure away when we wish to lift the statue, the bronze figure through the scaffolding. And having interrogated the uh, relationship between the bronze and the masonry, I could see that there was an ingenious method of fixing this uh, figure to the masonry. And it involved a threaded rod and effectively the bronze figure of Robert Burns was threaded onto and then turned until it met the level of the, um, the masonry underneath. And to just, this is a view of the stonemasons using a very fine drill, simply to drill that fixing out. Corrosion had meant that those threads were corrupted and would not, we were, un we were unable to unthread the bronze figure back through that thread. So we carefully drilled that thread out and lifted uh, the figure of Robert Burns high up over the scaffold. And there you can see um, the support system. So you can see extra buttressing within that plinth where the location of the um, uh, Robert Burns legs, feet attach themselves to this uh, bronze panel. And you can see um, in the center there, the central threaded uh, socket for this um, structure to be attached to the masonry. So here you can see that thread that was to go up through the, the, that base um, panel. And you can see here, we have a wonderful view of the top of that masonry. And I, like everyone else, love a selfie. And here I am taking a selfie with the recumbent figure of Robert Burns. 
very similar to the method of lying uh, Sir William McKinnon down, fully braced, fully secure using um, clean ratchet straps and softening where required. Museum grade plastisote was used in order to provide support and cushioning to different, different um, aspects, you know, for example, legs and projecting detail such as hand. That exercise created an opportunity. It made a movement within that first course of masonry. And so we were able to capitalize on this and very carefully um, lever the um, um, masonry up in order to um, get a view, get the straps directly underneath and lift that top stone away. And then the interesting journey started with understanding this statue and the processes by which it was placed where it was and instantly understanding some of the context of this statue. So having removed that top stone, what we can see, excuse me, what we can see with um, disappointment is that this statue was built with ordinary Portland cement and that it, that cement was poured into this statue as a liquid. And we would call that a cement fondue. So what we have, and the reason why we call it cement fondue is because it is the consistency of melted cheese. And so it goes into all of the interstices. It is leaking into every single part of this structure. And it is um, hard, it is too hard and it will cause, as we will see, detriment. Cement mortar, particularly hard cement fondue, is double, double damaging. Damaging when it was put in, and then doubly damaging when we try and take it out. But also what's of interest here is that as we lift that top stone off, the masons reveal a bottle. And within that bottle, and you can see the top of that bottle sitting on top of the cement fondue mortar right there, is a note. And that note is um, from our predecessors, but not our predecessors from 1898. These are our predecessors from 1961. Excuse me. So, um, for those of you that can't quite read this, this note, this handwritten note on the back of an invoice, of the company's invoice, states that this statue was removed 18 feet west to allow traffic to move more easily in August 1961. And it's the guys on the site who, who create this time capsule and they um, record who it is that's working on this uh, project. And so we can see that we have two stonemasons, we have a crane driver, and we have two laborers. And do you know what? That's not dissimilar to the setup that I had working on Sir William McKinnon. Um, so this is tantalizing. So suddenly we know that the, the statue of Robert Burns is not in its intended place. It has been moved. It moved in the wave of change that swept over Robert Burns was traffic management and its infrastructure development that moves it again. So we can see some of the collateral damage that's occurred as a result of the cement fondue material that the, the, those guys, the masons, the crane driver and the two laborers absolutely plastered this um, in the 1960s with ordinary Portland cement based mortar. And this is the damage that it does. It tears the edges of stone apart because the bond is so very strong between stone, between one stone and the other. We can see collateral damage right here. And here we can begin to see on the left hand side was where the bottle was located. You can, you can remember. And the masons under my supervision have very carefully um, excavated uh, that cement fondue and they've used best of 21st technology to do it. Diamond um, saws and um, 
drill bits and core drills with di diamond centered um, wearing surface to reduce percussion, but excavate this material, get this inauthentic material out of the structure. You can see that the masons aren't quite following my direction in terms of how to um, apply the numerical um, alphanumeric recording system, the ID system. They're using Tipex straight onto the stone surface, but we'll see this develop into a better process um, later on in the process. Right here, for example. So Paraloid B72, reversible acrylic resin painted onto the surface. We know how that comes off very well. Correction fluid, Tipex it's called. It's a white um, liquid material that is painted onto the Paraloid and then the black felt tip pen is painted on. The success of this depends on the quality of the pen. So some black felt tip pens, for example, fade under ultraviolet light. Um, so it, we have to use tried and tested um, materials and products in this process in, to ensure that it is entirely durable. And here you can see um, the paper that you can see on the surface, a protective bleach-free tissue that's been um, shrunk onto the masonry that's decayed as a result of the preferential erosion that I showed you a few slides ago. And here you can see a um, stonemason just very carefully rocking this large stone off its bed. And on the right hand side, you can see where um, the overhead beam has been brought, uh, the, the beam trolley with the chain wheel on it has lifted these stones out of the structure and placed them on a reception area on the scaffold. And why have I included a sketch of a wedge? Well, this is a sketch of a wedge and it became absolutely clear that we needed to refine the tools that were being used in the deconstruction. So the cement fondue nature of this construction meant that we needed to very carefully edge these stones apart. They didn't lift with ease, such as they did uh, at Sir William uh, MacKinnon and also the Earl Haig statue. So you have my very rudimentary sketch of hardwood wedges that are incredibly shallow, but incredibly durable and allow us to just open construction joints. And um, you can see one of those wedges at the top of the screen here. But on moving one of these stones, we revealed the time capsule. And so this is, um, was discovered obviously in 1961, but this time capsule dates from 1898. And what you can see on the left hand side is the most beautiful covering lead sheet. I heard the stonemason find this with his chisel when he was working just to remove the cement mortar from the top. And suddenly I've heard the sound of um, chisel on lead and ran down to see this beautifully polygrammatic, polychromatic, I should say, um, decorated lead sheet. You can see, if you look closely, you can see that it's um, coloured and that it has these sort of diamond scribed shape on it. And it's there to protect the, the time capsule that you can see on the right hand side. And this time capsule is located within a beautifully carved niche within the stonework. And there you can see, right, so what we can see is the beautifully carved niche, carved in 1898 when the original constructors of this statue were building it. But also this photograph demonstrates very well the incredibly hard and over durable nature of the um, ordinary Portland cement mortar. And you can see it forming a cross in the bottom of that um, hollowed out shape. And this requires um, further hard labor. And these short videos just show the efforts that are required using best material knowledge to ensure that the drill bits are sharp and effective to drill down through this ordinary Portland cement. But that's not enough because he also Diamond 
and late on you can see the hardware of the um, identification system you can see the black felt tip pen you can see the typing correction fluid and you can see these stones are marked up as i requested it has one of the hardwood um, wedges which was crucial to this exercise separating the stones and you can see that one of the stones is slung ready for lifting out of the structure and those stones have gone and now we're simply left with eight foundation stones around a central concrete core which the masons simply worked away with and as you can see needing to use all of the hardware that we did because of the 1961 intervention and I suddenly found myself as the opener of a time capsule in this very room, as you can identify. And so a collection of um, decision makers, stakeholders, and some of Scotland's press, television cameras and newspaper um, journalists came to view on Burns Night, the, or a few days before Burns Night, what was contained within the time capsule. And here you can see I'm ready to start. And the process of opening the time capsule was another exercise in conservation, recording very carefully what the item was before we intervened. And then taking clues from the structure itself, the item itself, as to how to open it. So what I did was I cut the neck off the time capsule in order to get a very good view of, the con of what was contained within it. And while I was having a look through the opening of the time capsule, um, so were the television cameras. And it was incredible that the, the, the newspaper journalists were jockeying for position because they could see the newspapers in the time capsule. And here you can see on the left-hand side where I've cut the lid off the um, time capsule. And I had to cut the lid off the time capsule because decay had um, prevented me from being able to simply unscrew it as the original designers had intended. So what I was then having to do was to very carefully open up this lead time capsule without detriment to the, to the contents. And as I'm doing this, I admire and um, recognize the virtuosity and use of material for this time capsule and that they've managed to weld this lead um, bottle up without causing any difficulty um, to the paper contents but it was not just paper uh, on the inside there were coinage there was a parchment letter to the future and there was this document which was um, a register of the crimes and offences and the punishments um, that had occurred on the streets of Leith in 1898. So on this sort of final note, I'm just gonna roll in another philosophical issue because we know, and I'm just gonna go back a slide just to demonstrate this, that in, 19, in 1898, they filled the time capsule with items that they wanted to communicate with their future with. So they used newspapers and they used coinage and they used a handwritten parchment letter. And the newspapers, for example, were tied, if you can see on the right hand side, tied with a ribbon, cotton ribbon, and tied very neatly with a knot that kept the rolled up newspaper beautifully secured. In 1961, when they moved the statue that, and they opened the time capsule themselves, and I'm a firm believer that they interfered with the cap, which is why I had to cut it off. But they inserted their own newspapers. And you can actually see on the right hand side, some of the 1961 newspapers, and they're bound in rubber bands. And what's interesting, and on a philosophical level, quite interesting to realize, is that the new technology failed. The rubber bands rotted very quickly within that time capsule. 
and allowed the newspapers to spread out. And yet the original ribbons that were used to tie up the 1898 were still totally fit for purpose and fully functional. So there's a lesson there that we should not rush to new technology because it's not proved and it's not utterly reliable in the way that some old technologies are. So there's another lesson that perhaps we can chat about in the chat. So back to the um, crimes and offences document that was included. This is another, this is statue used as um, communication device. This is our predecessors wishing to um, communicate, communicate many aspects of their society and their, um, the conditions within which they lived um, to us directly. So yes, it was opened in 1961, but I'm a firm believer that it was us that they really intended to, to speak to because um, we were more than 100 years on from, from this particular event. And on that, I will conclude. And um, I place for your interest all of my contact details using the different sort of social media uh, opportunities. So I would be more than happy to hear from you with regard to anything that I've mentioned within this um, presentation um, going forwards. Padma, thank you. Thank you, Nick. Thank you very much. I think a very interesting presentation and we do have questions some of them. So with your permission, I'll start taking up those if it's all right. Please. So the first question was, right, first case study, uh, well, how were the joints between the stone beds undone when the sculpture was being taken apart? And what were the two wooden planks one could see, you know, in the images used for while placing the stones in place? Very good, a lovely technical question. So, so William McKinnon was, um, late 19th century construction originally, but they used lime. And so that meant that the construction joints were simple to excavate and the individual elements were simple to um, uh, uh, separate. That's the first item. So the construction joints were simply cleaned out using um, hacksaw blades um, with insulation tape in order that it didn't cut the mason's fingers as they were using it. So this is a very fine saw to be able to remove as much material as possible. And the two planks were there because it was raining. Um, we had to undersling that stone, which meant that we had to place it down onto those planks um, in order to remove the slings. And then very quickly, even though it was raining, um, try and lift that stone, remove those planks, and gently lower the stone onto its lime water bed. Okay, thank you. The next question is, what skills must one learn in order to be able to construct, deconstruct historic outdoor sculptures? Um, there is obviously, in my view, an experience to be built up with understanding the interaction of different materials. Uh, in every single job that I've done in terms of deconstructing and then reconstructing um, public sculpture, there is an element of improvisation. You're having to adapt and change. But the standard message within this is that everything we do, we must do without causing any further damage or defect to the subject itself. So conservation of mind is, needs to be engaged at all times. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from me. I mean, you saw the last case study. Uh, where was it reconstructed, statue? Ah. And what happened to the time capsule? Very good. <coughs> Excuse me. This, <coughs> this case study is bang up to date. So the um, statue and the, the monument to Robert Burns remains deconstructed 
in storage until such time as the tram infrastructure has been built, and in which case it will be rebuilt near its previous uh, position. And the time capsule is within this building. So I am storing this for the client. Um, and just in case anything happens to me, the time capsule has been recorded and, and is in a container which clearly explains what it is and what it is intended for. So this is again all part of the sort of conservation of the original designer's intention to make sure that all these elements go back together. And what I didn't say was that we now have an opportunity to create time capsule and we must think carefully um, how and learn lessons from the successes and the failures of the past. Um, and I think that lead vessel is the most uh, spectacularly successful vehicle for transporting delicate materials far into the future. Um, and that is what we will be doing. Uh, this is just a philosophical question. The time capsule was laid back in 19, 1897. 1961, they did attempt to open it successfully and insert new things and put it back. But 2019, the way it's been opened, I mean, it's, it's the capsule is almost like you've opened it completely. So would it have been better to just put it back or you think that that was not the intention? Just place it back where it was intended, maybe for someone else to open it at a later stage. Just, just a philosophical question, just something. Yep. Uh, brilliant. So I think this philosophical consideration is absolutely key and acute. Okay, so um, I'm a conservator and I opened that time capsule in such a way as I hoped that it could be repaired and the authenticity of that time capsule would not be challenged. And that I think is the case. So the opening that you see are along original construction lines. So this is where the lead was rolled over and, and uh, welded. And I simply opened up the weld and opened it up enough to get, you saw a picture of me with some very long tweezers. This is the, this is the method by which I removed those items. So the original time capsule, the lead time capsule, will be carefully reconstructed and absolutely as it is, be reinterred within the, within, will be repaired, re-welded, and the items replaced within it. Even the 1961 items replaced within it even with their original mistakes of their rubber bands that decayed, they will go in. Um, we will use the philosophy of that lead vehicle to create our own lead vehicle and insert newspaper items from this occasion of opening that time capsule so that we can push this intervention into the understanding of, the, of our successes going forwards. Yeah, how common are time capsules? Is it a common occurrence? This is the first time I've heard a case study. So is it something that you encounter most of your... Yeah, I think it's human nature to wish to sort of, where they're creating something for posterity, they like to, we like to mix, share something of ourselves, something of our own. And what's fascinating was that they, in 1961, when they moved that statue, yes, the local Burns Society were responsible for creating that beautiful lead vessel, but it was the guys on the site who felt compelled to write their own time capsule in that bottle at the top of the structure. So, I, so yes is the answer. I find other attempts by our predecessors to communicate with us now, and it's a joy to find them. Thank you. The next question is, could you please specify any of the masonry skills that one might need to learn to attempt construction and deconstruction of outdoor sculptures? What kind of masonry skills should one have? That is a very good question. So masonry skills would include the lifting, the careful lifting and moving of large, heavy, but fragile items. So there is a skill in ensuring that the slings are attached correctly. There is skill in terms of communication with the layman who is on the controls of the crane. That was the case in every single one of these case studies, the communication with the guy on the levers. And in addition to that, the mason must know how to clean construction joints without tickling 
the arises of the stone, no matter how hard the material is, we must find a way to work in the most sympathetic way possible. For example, Robert Burns benefited, the deconstruction of Robert Burns benefited from the nightly soaking of the structure to soak the um, ordinary Portland cement fondue material because what the water does it infiltrates the difference between the, the stone and the cement and over time will help to create the um, division but the mason is the enactor of that the mason needs to soak the masonry structure the mason needs to then take um, as you saw industrial scale of tools um, hammers drills and cutting wheels to uh, ensure that the the subject is is um, re relieved of the inauthentic materials and that we're in a position to reconstruct Robert Burns effectively and beautifully as the original designers intended in the future. Thank you. Again, next question is, did you face any opposition from the local community in the translocation of some of these installations? Um, we do have, right, so what's interesting is that so often um, people are unaware of or walk past beautiful um, public statuary and just see it as an everyday occurrence. And the reason, and what instantly happens as soon as you build a scaffold around a subject and it suddenly becomes important and people are anxious to ensure that whatever is happening to it, it will not cause a great deal of change. And so there is, a matter, there is an aspect of managing this expectation and um, easing people's consciousness that the intervention, even though it sounds damaging, and even though it appears to use industrial equipment, it's what we're intending to provide is the continuation of this particular piece of public sculpture far into the future. In fact, with the Robert Burns statue, we had stakeholders, local stakeholders, and by that I mean people who lived near it, um, viewing us and, and photo photographing us from their windows, you know, recording, not maliciously, not, not trying to sort of trip us up, but just wishing to record the event of mm -hmm. moving the statue. And so, um, this, this, was, this was interesting. Thank you. The next question is, will you reconstruct the burn statue using lime mortar instead of Portland cement? We will rebuild Robert Burns using lime-based mortar, just as it was constructed in 1898. And we have, in spite of the great deal of cement fondue everywhere, we have uh, original lime mortar adherences left on the stone so we can replicate the mix and use that in the reconstruction. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, I don't see any more questions. So I think, um, thank you so much, Nick, for wonderful. Everyone, please note that talk time was five o'clock. A lot of us joined us at five thirty. Confusion today. Uh, most of them joining at five thirty. So tomorrow again, the talk time is the five o'clock. So please bear that in mind. Thank you, Nick. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. See you again. Thank you. Bye. Bye.